Hosting for the Dice Tower is generously provided by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, Episode 492, Resolutions. And welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Scott gives us the biography of a famous hare and tortoise. Brian goes digging for a classic, and Jeff gets random. Plus, we learn a little bit about time zones. We present a tale of board gaming horror. We answer some of your questions from the mailbag, and we share our gaming resolutions for 2017. I'm Eric Summerer. And here's your host, the ash to my Pikachu, Tom Vassell. I feel very... Okay, first of all, before we go any farther, did you pick this because you thought it sounded like revolutions? No, no. I just thought it was a good pair, and um, my youngest is so obsessed with Pokemon, it's all I can think about right now. Yeah, well, I don't want to be the ash to your Pikachu, because Ash treats Pikachu horribly. No, they're buddies. He sticks them in a little ball. No, Pikachu doesn't go in the little ball. That's the whole thing. No one puts Pikachu in a Pokeball. Oh, the other ones do. It's it's still very weird. Well, I will admit that. What's especially weird is that, one, they're still making episodes of this program. And, two, my son is watching. there's There's a Pokemon app. And so you can watch, like, any episode from the TV show. And so he's skipping around through time frame, like the, the first season of the show, and then he finds some episode he likes from, you know, eight years ago, and then he finds another one from last season or something, and it's just messing with my head because the voices keep changing, and Ash keeps getting older and then younger and then older, and it's really weird. Why doesn't he just watch him in order? I, that would be what, in, what, what normal people would do, yes. That is what some parents and sister children do because it drives me nuts. Well... I'm just giving them their freedom, I guess. Strength of will. <laughs> I see there's other things here written about Pokemon. There is. I mean, I, The other reason that I, I have Pokemon on the brain is that I was recently a guest on a Pokemon podcast called Poke Press, And it's available both on YouTube and as a podcast. Uh, and I was talking about my experiences with the Pokemon card game uh, and its relation to designer board gaming. And hopefully I sounded intelligent enough to uh, to maintain some semblance of order. But that's available now. You can uh, track that down. It's Poke Press is the name of the podcast. And I'm also a guest on Scott King's Creators Cast coming up in the next month or so, uh, in which I, I talk about audiobook work and uh, work here on the Dice Tower. And it's a lovely conversation with the guy who does the gaming calendars uh, that, that lots of people have uh, have enjoyed over the years and is hanging up in my studio as well. Eric certainly is making the rounds. I am. I'm the promotional he's gonna be, machine. He's going to be a solo artist soon. <laughs> I don't know what I would do without you, Tom. <laughs> I can, I, I'm sure it's a book. Um, <laughs> Probably, well, yes. It would folks, not be a podcast. This is not a Pokemon uh, podcast. This is a show about all card and board games. Welcome to the show. I'm Tom Vassell. Hi there. I'm Eric Summerer. And uh, we got some uh, housekeeping to do, first of all. Don't forget, our 500th episode is only eight episodes away. Whoa. We've been running a contest for this in which you can enter. You just have to um, send us an email with the subject 500. That's the number, by the way. The number 500. Zero, zero. Mm. And then there's a space, not the word space, not quotation space, but right. an actual physical space that comes when you press the big button. That's where your thumbs should rest if you type properly. Oh, like on the keyboard. Then reasons, the word R-E-A-S-O-N-S, so 500 space reasons. Anyway, if that's in the subject, then send us, you can send us up to three entries. One, uh, something that you enjoy about our show and something that you'd like to see changed about the show. Maybe a favorite segment of the show, some moment in time that you really enjoyed. And if you send us a clip, I'll even throw in an extra entry for that. Nice. I can tell you now, the people who are sending in clips, I'm really enjoying listening to some of these old ones. Yeah? A lot of them uh, have either you or me messing up. <laughs> okay. 
Oh, uh, great. I'm looking forward to a whole string of those that we can put together for 500. Ah, uh, yes. Are, are you dreading a little bit this prep work for 500? Um, yes, a little bit, especially since I have no idea what you're getting into your inbox. So I, I don't even know where to start. I'm thinking I'm about to send these in bulk to you. <laughs> uh, people have asked about deadlines for this. When when do you think we're going to shut down this contest? We're not going to announce the winner of the contest until episode 500. Uh, but we're going to shut it down February 15th. That sounds nice and even or odd, I guess. <laughs> okay, so that's one piece of news. The other piece of news is our, we are in the final 10 days of our fundraiser for the Dice Tower. But there's even a more stringent limit on that. Okay, We've already talked about Dice Tower fundraiser. If you enjoy our show, I know some of you might be waiting till the last second because, well, you that's what you do. Um, but Indiegogo, which is what we're using – is going to stop using PayPal. Oh. Um, not really thrilled about that, but hey, it is what they're doing. And they're stopping on the 25th. So if you're going to use PayPal, you hmm. need to do it by January 25th, 2017. Okay. They're switching over to Stripe, which is something Kickstarter did a couple years ago. They switched from Amazon to Stripe. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what goes on behind the scenes and all that jazz. But either way, folks... Uh, we have funded, and we are now trying to get the different stretch goals. Eric has to do his top 100. I do, and the kids are excited already. All right. So, And we still have other stretch goals and things that we're trying to do. Uh, we're very close to having a booth at Essen, so that's exciting. Woo-hoo. We might have that by the time you hear this. So with all that being said, it's time to talk about some games. Do you know that today I played the worst game of 2016, I think? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. I, I need to. I need to talk about this one. Um, Please, I'm excited. I'm gonna. I'm gonna replace the first game on our list here with okay. this one because it's called uh, "Revenge of the Dictators." Really? Now, I don't know if you saw these guys. They were actually very close to our booth at Essen this year. They were on the other side of uh, QSF Games. Okay, I think I missed them. Yeah, I think I missed them too. Apparently they were wearing like um, shirts, like Hawaiian shirts or whatever, like dictators or whatever on vacation. Yeah, okay. So apparently in this game, the dictators of the world are all in Hawaii and they need some revenge. I don't know what they need revenge for because I feel like if anyone needs revenge against them, it's the dictators. (laughs) Because each of these dictators has – Various names, but the artwork is not like cartoony. They they just have pictures of every pretty much evil person from the last two centuries. From and world then they history. change the names a little bit. Like we have Adolf Hif- Hipster. Ah. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of really bad guys here. And it's really hard to play as Adolf Hipster because he doesn't look like Adolf Hipster. He looks like someone else I might know from history. Hmm. And so anyway, so you pick one of these characters. Fine. Your goal is to disarm four nuclear facilities in the North American continent and then go to the White House and demand that the president hand over the reins of the country to you. Now, that's okay as a theme, I guess. It's it's a bit ludicrous, right? But it is (laughs) what it is, right? So there's all the states of America are are on this map and some cities in Canada and Mexico, and there's some nuclear facilities on these, and each person gets four cards. There's the America's divided into three zones. It's also divided into ten time zones. Now, when I mentioned this and Sam said, well, they're European, I I understand (laughs) that, but I think it's something you could look up on the internet. Yes. How many time zones America has? Yes. Maybe they didn't mean that they were time zones, but they're called time zones. Anyhow. Hey, uh, future Eric here. Uh, if there's any time for me to jump in, it's probably now. Uh, so I did go on the Internet just because I was curious to see how many time zones are in North America. And contrary to Tom's derision there, there are actually eight time zones in North America. We begin with a specialized time zone for Newfoundland. That's uh, three and a half hours behind Greenwich Mean Time. It's abbreviated P with an asterisk. I'm not even sure how you say that, but that's what it is. 
Then there's the Atlantic time zone, the Eastern time zone, Central, Mountain, Pacific. Then Alaska has the Yukon time zone, and some of the Aleutian Islands、uh, fall in the Alaska Hawaii time zone, which is ten hours behind GMT. So that's eight different time zones. Still not ten. I don't know how that relates to the game itself, but they're not that far off. Just wanted to be accurate. Back to past Tom and Eric. So on your turn, you have some actions. It's, so you have a nuclear facility that's in three sections of America that you have to destroy, and you have one that's outside America, like in Canada or Mexico. Okay. So on your turn, you have three actions. One of those actions can be a move. That's it. So you can move one space,、um, or and there's lines connecting all these things on the board, so you can move along one of these lines.、Uh, the rest of your moves are basically drawing cards, and then some cards cost actions to play, and then you use your actions to play these cards.、So、you can draw cards or play cards. Most of the cards are things like Eric, you lose a turn,、um, and uh, let's see,、um, yeah, Eric, you need to go back to Hawaii or Guantanamo Bay, whatever.、Yeah. You know, just things like that. But what you want to do is you want to disable a nuclear facility. So you once you get to a nuclear facility, you have to basically spend your whole turn, well, two of two of your three actions, and you say, "I'm disarming this one." You roll a die, and if you roll a, <laughs> I think it's a three, four, five, or six, it's disarmed. A one or two is a miss.、Hmm. Except Eric will roll a four, and then I'll play a card that says, "No, Eric, you actually failed." Oh. But eventually, Eric will get through this, unless, of course, I throw him into another state, put blockades next to the roads, and don't let him move for several rounds. Oh! Or Eric might decide to draw a card from the deck, and it's one of several founding fathers. Now, I'm not really sure on the theming here, <laughs> but Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and all them can show up in the deck. Oh! <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. Are they ghosts from the past? Beating up on these dictators, but anyhow, when they show up, they're like horrible. Like I got one. I, I'm sorry. I'm trying to think of his actual name because I was not calling him by that name. I was calling him a much more angry term <laughs> over the course of the game. But anyhow, this one guy I got, and I had him for the entirety of the rest of the game. And each turn, I would roll a die, and something bad would happen to me depending on what I rolled. It、Wait, this say, guy just sit- sticks with you for the rest of the game? Well, there was one of the one of the numbers on the die he would move to somebody else. I I never rolled that number. Uh huh. So I would roll lose three, you know, lose three cards from your hand. Okay, next time you can't move this turn. Oh, okay. <laughs> And you know, there's all kinds of things like you <clears throat> eventually you can go to you can go try to persuade the president anytime you want. So you go to Washington D.C. And then you flip a card from a stack of the cards in Washington D.C. You flip a card, and it tells you if the president's there. If he's not there, tough luck. In fact, one of the cards says, "Oh, he's not in Washington D.C. He's in Washington State." What? And now everyone has to travel back across the country to Washington State. <laughs> But let's say he's there. You then roll a twenty-sided die. If you disabled no nuclear devices, then you have to roll a twenty. If you disabled one nuclear device, you have to roll an eighteen. If you disable two, you have to roll a fourteen, and if you disable three, you have to roll eight or higher. If you do so, you win. Unless, of course, someone has one of the many cards in the deck that says you're trying to persuade the president has failed. <laughs> oh, so that's all well and exciting. Now you you only you have four nuclear facilities you need to do, but to persuade the president, he only cares about American ones. So why would you ever go do the ones in Mexico or Canada? That's so that when you go and disable one of those, you flip over a tile and it tells you something that you can do in the future, which might be switch all the meeples on the board in any in any way that you feel like it. <laughs> Or one that's really cool, it says switch everything with someone else, including cards,、um, everything. Right? Uh huh. Uh, uh, <laughs> wow, the board looks great. Right. The reason I'm not giving this a one, I'm giving it a two. Ah. The board looks nice. The cards look good. The artwork is okay for the most part, if very realistic. But wow, it's so random.、Mm. I like got to Washington D.C. and someone played a card that sent me to Guantanamo Bay, and then that person 
got sent to a state that had barriers around it, so they couldn't even get out. They had to go drive all the way around the country to get up to Washington, D.C. Someone else got to Washington, D.C., turned the card over to see the president, but the president was apparently playing golf that day. Mm. And and here's the deal. I was like, wow, this game must be getting destroyed. I went to Board Game Geek, and there's like several tens. What? People are like, wow, it's lighthearted fun. No, it's lighthearted garbage. Okay. Okay, this is probably actually more mild than my video review is going to be. Uh-huh. But I, I – shame on these designers. Shame on this publisher for making this sort of nonsensical garbage. We, this is the year 2017. We have at least 30 years of amazing games that have been out. There is no excuse to put out something that is just this badly designed. Don't hmm. buy this game, people. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, oh, well, it's not for me. It's not for anybody. Hmm. If you do see a copy, burn it. <laughs> but you'd have to buy it first and then burn it. In my opinion. Yeah, yeah, don't 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 uh yeah, right. don't buy a game and burn it. Just I, run the other direction. If okay. you see someone pulling off the shelf, kindly slap their hands. <laughs> uh, I don't know. If it was a Kickstarter, it raised like thirty five thousand euros. What? I, I I don't get it. Am I out of touch with the gaming community? Well, that's a separate question. But uh, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, this just doesn't sound like something I would enjoy. I don't. I can't think of anybody who would enjoy it. Even like Munchkin people. I think after a while, it's a take that game, right? But yeah. It's a take that game that's like really long and like I got to watch DC. No, you didn't. <laughs> I, I I don't get that. <laughs> like. The cards are super powerful, but there's so many cards that just cancel someone else. Oh, I cancel your card. Why? <laughs> I don't know. I had it. Yeah. Great. Bring us up. There's no way you can give a worse game than that. Oh, no. No, and I, I definitely enjoy So that was Revenge of the Dictators. Um, this is uh, Hero Realms, which uh, is, is hitting distribution now. It's uh, widely available. Hero Realms is, as many people have described and is absolutely true, a fantasy version of Star Realms from White Wizard Games. Uh, and and uh, the basic game is very much that. Uh, you could almost do a direct translation of the four suits and cards uh, that, that translate exactly to Star Realms cards. The big difference is that there's a... You sort of start with a basic deck that is slightly advanced. You already have a couple of better cards in your deck. So that's kind of cool. It starts to give you, gives you a jump start. Yeah, that also, does sound good. Also, the base game uh, has four decks in it. Uh, so you can play with four players right off the bat. And one of my favorite variants is a partnership game in which you, you've got two, you and your partner are sitting next to each other, uh, sitting across the table from the other pair, and you take your turn simultaneously, pull your attack and buying, buying power, and then can purchase cards to give to either player's deck or decide on your target on who you want to hit on the other side of the table. Which means that one player could focus on a monetary engine and the other teammate could focus on an attack engine and we can pool our money and get you a really expensive card. I get nothing on our turn and then we maybe trade off on the next turn. But that means you get a super awesome card earlier that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to afford until several turns later in, uh, in a standard game. I thought it was cool. Uh, I liked that system. And then uh, visited at uh, BGGCon with Mr. Healy, and he's like, well, have you played with the character decks? I said, the, the what now? Oh, yeah, I got the character decks. The, 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 the what's? And these, I don't know why I need to hear like, the story of how you played the game. I think it makes it more interesting. Um, these are add-on decks, uh, little packs of cards that give you a specific starting deck for a character class. Uh, so the basic starting decks are out. You get now a special uh, custom starting deck that also includes a special power. That uh, There's one innate ability. There's one one-time use ability. There's a, a card that you can uh, use one time. And this was a lot of fun as well because now you've got a special power. You have sort of a, a style to your deck a uh, play style that you can work with. That's a lot of fun. And I'm really looking forward to the the quest expansion that allows you to turn it into a co-op like uh, anthology game 
That's going to be cool. So big thumbs up for Hero Realms. I don't have those character decks yet, the character packs, but I'm I'm definitely going to get them, even just with the base set. It comes in a nicer box than Star Realms. It comes with enough cards for four players, and I really like the partnership game. So very pleased with Hero Realms so far. Thumbs up. Now, I believe, I'm not sure if it was last year. I think it might have been two years ago. I talked to the folks from Calliope Games about this Kickstarter that they were running. Uh, what was this Kickstarter called, Eric? It was like Great Games or something? Oh, boy. Like a great designer series, basically, right? Right. What they were doing is they were, they were kickstarting a bunch of family games that were I'm, – I'm sorry. Yeah, a bunch of family games. I, I, it was, it's called the Titan Series. That's it. All right, so this was kickstarted in May 31st, and it had got $200,000, and they didn't even tell you what the games were. Mm -hmm. You were essentially subscribing to a series of games done by famous designers. So they got Richard Garfield, one of the most famous designers in the world, Paul Mm -hmm. Peterson, who did Smash Up, Jordan and Zach Wiseman, Eric Lang, Seth Johnson, Mike Slinker, Mike Elliott, Rob Davieu, and Mike Mulville Hill, or... James Ernest, Matt Forbeck, Peggy Brown. So each year they were going to give three games. So it looks like it goes on for four years. Okay. Well, the first year was last year, 2016. And near the end of the year, they came out with the three games. Now, the Richard Garfield one I have not yet played. Um, but that I'm pretty sure I have played it because I know that it's a, it's a reworking of his what, – what were you thinking? Okay. I, I don't know I don't know what you you know about that game. I don't know about that game. Uh that's like a party game in with, with which you say um well the the general gist, gist of it is something people play on the internet. Well they'll say what is your fa- you know name five movies everyone should see. So you write down five movies everyone should see and you get points for every person you match. Hmm. So you're trying to be the least original. <laughs> okay, it's actually a pretty fun party game, and it came out so many years ago, and I believe his game is a reworking of that. The other two games that came out, there was Menu Manager. This is from the uh, Jordan Jordan Wiseman, uh, who is the, the – he designed um, Battletech and things like that. And then the last one, and the one that I'm talking about today, is Running with the Bulls. This one is from Paul Peterson, and he did uh, Smash Up and Guillotine. Mm-hmm. And I had heard that this one had a pachinko-type concept. I think you might have seen this at Origins, Eric. Yes, I, I remember and was interested in it. Well, yes, the, the whole pachinko concept sounds pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So in this game, you are partaking in the most foolish of sports, running with the bulls. Not sure why people do it, but they do it. So in this game, your people who are running from the bulls are dice. So you will roll your dice at the beginning of a round, and it shows where they start at the top of the board. And each – you also roll some bulls, which are bigger dice, and put them in various spots at the top of the board. Then each person's going to play a card that will do different things. Maybe it will let you re-roll some dice. Maybe you can change a die. You can move a bull die from one spot to another spot, all sorts of different actions like that. After that's done – all the people and bulls will move down to the next level on the board. And most of the time, there's an odd and even path. So if you're an odd number, you'll go one way. If you're an even number, you'll go another way. Mm -hmm. After everybody has moved, if any of your dice are with a bull, that is the exact same number as them. So if I'm at the end of a path and there's a bull that's a four and I'm also a four, I have to re-roll all my dice that show fours. And if they match that bull or any other bull, they're eliminated and those dice are out. I guess they got trampled. Yes. And then you play another round of cards, and then you drop down to the next level. You play another round of cards, drop down to the next level. So you do that four times. Then when they get to the bottom, whichever cards they've landed on, that's how many points they get. You calculate that out. You give out point tokens. All the runners who have been trampled miraculously come back from the dead. You put everyone at the top, and you do the same thing three times for three days' worth. The artwork in this game is really well done. It looks like a retro game, like from the 70s or 80s. Mm-hmm. 
almost Mad Magazine style. There's bulls all over it doing weird things. It, yeah. I, I like it. It looks really good. I like the dice that are all over the board. It's not completely useful, though, because there's odd and even paths to move on. And even though the odds are one color and the evens are another color, it still seems to be very confusing sometimes which is moving where. And the dice, I love these dice. They're like the little small Chessex ones with rounded corners. Rounded corner dice are great to me because I love rolling them. They roll really well. But when moving rounded dice on a board, it's really easy to accidentally change the sides of them. Mm. So I found that a bit problematic, especially because you're moving. I mean, each player starts with like six dice or something, or five dice, or whatever. And then, you know, five or four or five people are playing. That's a lot of dice all over this board. Right. Here's the deal, though. It's an entertaining concept in your head. Yeah. And especially for someone like Eric, who thinks Pachinko is in the top 10 games ever made. It's pretty fun. I'm not, I'm, I agree. But here's the thing about Pachinkos. Let's say I go to Chuck E. Cheese, which is my uh, gambling hall of choice. And I drop a coin in some sort of pink pachinko machine. Hey, future Eric here again, since I'm here anyway. Uh, I think Tom's confusing Plinko with pachinko, but uh, I I didn't want to ruin his role. He seemed to be on a roll, so I I just let him go. What can I do to make it get to the spot I want it to get to? Not much. Right. In this game, same thing. Hmm. Yes, you can play a card that lets you re-roll dice. You can play a card that lets you move stuff. But everyone else is also doing that. Hmm. So it's extremely chaotic. Everyone's moving around. And then when you, you your dice move, they go down the next level. There might be a bowl that's got there because someone else moved it from a different direction. And then you roll to see if you're trampled, which is just sheer luck. Right. And at the bottom, there's these cards with point totals on, and people can change those. You can change the orders of those as you're dropping down. And so you'll be like, whoa, I just got 16 points. How many did you get? I got five. Wow, well, okay. What did you do differently than me? Uh, <laughs> and yeah. so the concept is interesting. It's a, it sounds f- more fun than it is, but in reality, it's just random luck, which even then I might be okay with it, but it's way l- feels longer than it should. Hmm. You have to, you do everything. Everyone plays a card and they play a card and they manipulate dice and you go around a table and everyone does that. And then you're like, okay, which dice go here? Okay. These dice go here. These dice go here. These dice go here. These dice go here. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, round two. Everyone's going to play another card. And then when you're done, you're like, okay, whew, was that the game? No, no, that was the first day. We got to do that three times. <laughs> and, and you're like, oh, oh. And, you know, I really wanted to like this game. I think Paul's a, a good designer. But this is solidifying my opinion of the series is that you can't make a designer design a game on demand. Hmm. A designer has a game that he brings to the company. You can't say, make me a good family game. They might right. do it. It might work. But so far, I've played two of the three games, and they're both just – they're okay at best. At best, they're okay. Hmm. I don't know if the Richard Garfield one's good, but the other one, Menu Manager, is just – it's a very boring version of the game that Eric talked about, I think, last week, Jorvik. Yeah. It's like Jorvik if you took out most of the strategy. Oh, great. So, I don't know. I, I mean, there's still hope. I mean, there's Eric Lang. Has he designed a bad game? Well, he has. But, I mean, <laughs> you know, will these other designers do something amazing? Maybe. I'm not hearing any talk about these games, are you? No, not really. I had forgotten about it, actually. I forgot about them, too, until we were at Cool Stuff last week, and I walked through, and I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, these sound these sound good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we'll see. Maybe it's better. And maybe some people will like them more because Calliope definitely does cater to a family audience, right? True. And that's fine. Yeah. But there's a lot of family games that offer better meaningful choices than these two games did. Anyway, I'm talking mostly about running with the bulls. Speaking of blind luck, uh, next up for me is Batman the Animated Series The Dice Game. This is a co-publication. Is this the Zombies remake? This is the – well, I was going to get to that, but yes, uh, it's a co-publication oh, between Spoilers. Cryptozoic and Steve Jackson games, and it is very much a retheme of Zombie Dice, uh, except it's now Batman the Animated Series with that style of artwork, and there are player powers that you're assigned at the beginning. You're playing one of the iconic villains from the animated series. You could be the Joker, the Riddler, Catwoman, or Poison Ivy. Each of these has some sort of special power, a little token that goes in front of you that gives you like a scoring bonus or or a special ability. You have a 
cylinder, a cylindrical container that has all these dice, and there's three flavors of dice. Uh, there's there's three, or excuse me, two yellow dice, which are the most dangerous. Then there's blue dice, and then there are gray dice. And the dice have bat symbols on them. You don't want those. Those are bad. There's money symbols. Batman is good. What did you just say? No, we're villains. You, you can't. You have, you're fighting Batman. You don't That's want true, Batman. He's still, he's still good. He's still, okay, he's good, but not for us. <laughs> okay, sorry. Go ahead. Um, for, for, there's also money symbols. That's what you want. That's what you're scoring. And then there are alarm symbols that when those come up, uh, it, they're, they're like the shotguns in, uh, in zombie dice. They, they, or the, the running symbols. They're like the running symbols. Uh, they force you to re-roll those dice uh, when, you, when you continue going. So you, you roll and uh, you can decide to continue or not. You have to draw back up to three and, and then roll those dice. And eventually you choose to stop or you've rolled three bat symbols and you have busted for the round. Uh, Poison Ivy gets to dodge one of the bat symbols. Uh, Catwoman gets double points for the blue money bag symbols. The Riddler gets to roll four dice at the beginning of his turn. And you play to a certain total or a certain number of times around the, uh, the board. And highest score wins. And that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I wasn't swayed by this one. Uh, I enjoy zombie dice. This one was not different enough. To, to say, oh, wow, this is a totally different game. It's very much a retheme with those very minor player powers included. Uh, if I didn't already have zombie dice, I would maybe consider Batman because I'd certainly enjoy the theme better. So I guess this, this outranks zombie dice. But if you already have zombie dice, it's not different enough to seek out, if that makes sense. So, yeah, thumbs up for a light dice game, but not one that I'm going to seek out to, to add to my collection. That's Batman, the animated series, the dice game. But what if it's the... What if you don't have either? If you have neither, I would go with Batman. I mean, it is a, it's a fun, light dice game, but I like Martian dice better than both of these. What about the hunting one? The hunt... Bears? No, there's a hunting version of the zombies Oh, hunting dice. No, I haven't, I haven't played that. I'd, I'd still rather choose Batman. Okay, well, that's that was the right answer. I'm I'm just testing you. Okay. What if there was a Pokemon version? Ooh. What if there was a Powerpuff Girls version? Oh man. Um. Uh, then the uh. uh yeah. The Go answer's ahead. still Batman, Eric. Oh. I lose. All right. The last game I'm talking about today, or at least now, is Jump Drive. Have you heard of this game, Eric? Uh, it, this is the standalone Race for the Galaxy game, right? Right. It's based on a German game designed by Tom Lemon, who designed Race for the Galaxy. But they decided to port it into the Race for the Galaxy. And this is used as an intro of sorts to Race for the Galaxy, although the games are completely not compatible. But they decided to use the same uh, uh, symbology just in case you want it to be not confused too bad. Um, so, oh, but the game, the game itself is really quite good. It's a big deck of cards that's made up of planets and technologies. These planets and technologies have various costs on them, and you will draw a handful of these cards at the beginning of the game. And then you put a pile of points in the middle of the table, and you will start playing the game, and when one player gets 50 points or more, the game ends that round, and whoever has the most points wins, probably the guy who got 50. Each turn, you will play one planet, one technology, or one of each. When you play a normal planet or a technology, the, each of those has a number on it, and that's how many other cards you need to discard from your hand to be able to play that. Okay. If you play only a technology, you get a discount of one when playing that technology card. If you play only a planet, when you're done paying for the planet, you get to draw a card from the deck. This is deliberately from Race for the Galaxy. I think it would have been easier if they just said if you play a planet or technology, you and you only play one, you get a discount of one. But I guess they were trying to keep it as similar to the regular game as you could. Okay. When you play these cards, they go face up in front of you, and each card will then, after everyone's done playing cards, you look at all the cards that you've placed in front of you so far, and they tell you how many points you get. So if I put out a card on the first turn, that gives me two points. Every turn, that card gives me two points. Yeah, okay. So the more expensive the card, the more points that it's worth. And some cards will get points based on if you have other cards. It might say you get a point for each mining planet you have, which are brown colored planets. You know, or this one gives you two points for every other copy of this card in your deck, etc. Or out in front of you. 
Sometimes they give special abilities. It says, you know, that from now on, to put out this kind of planet is minus one. Things like that. Also, when you're done getting points, you then will draw more cards in your hand. Each card in front of you will tell you how many cards it allows you to draw. Many of them don't allow you to draw any, but some allow you to draw one or two or whatever. So you draw those cards in your hand and you start the next round. You might not want to or can't play a planet or technology from your hand on your turn. So instead, there are two things you can do. You can, you can play a tile that basically lets you draw a bunch of cards and then discard some. Or you can take another card that essentially gives you some stats. It gives you some military power. This game comes – some of the cards give you dirt, certain amounts of military power. And there are planets that are military planets. They have a, they're, they're red, so you can differentiate them. Those planets you can put in front of you if you have enough military power. You do not need to, to discard cards from your hand like normal planets. And that's what you do. So someone gets 50 points. So it's a lot simpler than Race for the Galaxy. Mm-hmm. It's also, you know, a de- there's a decent amount of luck in it. But there's strategy. You know, okay, what cards am I going to do? What combo of cards am I going to play this turn? What cards am I going to use? Because you'll have like five cards in here. You're like, oh, this is a great hand. But wait a minute. If I play this card, which is cost four, I have to discard the other four cards. Oh. So that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I really like it a lot, actually. I was really impressed with it. I'm currently undefeated playing it. <laughs> um, but it's just – it offers some strategy and some tactics. Now, it does have the problem that some Euro games like Russian Railroads have where I feel like – most of the time, the game ends after the seventh or eighth turn. That seems pretty close to where it ends. Mm-hmm. I would say on turn five, sometimes you're like, oh, you know what? I'm not going to win. Because <laughs> uh. <laughs> once someone gets – let's say on the first turn, I get a point and you get two points. And then the second turn, I get two points and you're getting five. And the mm. third turn, I'm like, oh, I'm up to 10 and you're up to 12. Right. Like, oh, you know what? I'm never going to catch him. <laughs> I'm not going to catch you, yeah. And you might you might catch the other person. That's fine. And it's not a long game. We're talking 15, 20 minutes. The only other problem I have with the game is that it can be confusing um, sometimes because you there, Race for the Galaxy has very little interaction. This game has less hmm. <laughs> because you're essentially playing cards from your hand and doing it. Sometimes it will say if you do thus and thus. If someone else has this card, you get some points or whatever. You know, there's a few minor interactions. So everyone has these cards, they play them, they get their points. And occasionally, if you're not careful, you can be like, wait a minute, are we all on the same turn? Because you can't just count the cards in front of you because sometimes you play two cards and sometimes you play one. Hmm. So that, that we, 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 we tried to be like, all right, let's stop. Has everyone got their card? All right, let's all play our cards at the same time. But it can get. But once you play the cards, you flip them over. You're so caught up in your own little engine that you're not really keeping an eye on everybody else. Right. So, I. But I do enjoy it. I. I, I went into it thinking I would not. I thought we do need a streamlined race for the galaxy. This does in no way replace this race for the galaxy. It's just another light, fun game in the same universe. I wish there was some way to like. Say, ooh, not only can you play a game with these cards, but you can also use them in Race for the Galaxy. But that's not happening. Hmm. They did reuse all the artwork, though. <laughs> well, okay. That's efficient. So that's Jump Drive. But that was not my favorite game I played this week. Oh. Uh, I'll let Eric talk about that one. Oh, okay. My last game is called When I Dream. This is a uh, party, I guess, word game from Draw Lab Entertainment. And I got this uh, when we were in Essen based solely on the art design. Uh, There is a deck of cards uh, containing words. And it's actually there's two words on each card. And the illustration on that card combines those two words. Um, I think the one that, that really got me was bacon and gondola, which have no relationship to each other, except in this illustration that is a bacon gondola. That just totally drew me in. I said, I, ha- I have to f- learn more about this game. But you've got but your... just to be clear, that has nothing to do with the game at all. It very much has nothing to do with the game at all. Uh, in fact, the, the, the words, the relationship between the two of them on what, that card don't have any gameplay factor at all because you are either going to play with the top cards on the card, top words on the card, or the bottom words. It's sort of a beginner and advanced set of words. 
it's sort of like any party game that has two words on the same card. You can decide to play one set or the other. So you've decided you're going to play with the top words or the bottom words. You've got a stack of cards that have these words on them. One player is the dreamer, and they're going to put a cloth mask, this nice little sleep mask, on their face. And then the they're going to turn up one of these cards, and the rest of the group is going to try and get the dreamer to guess the card, the, uh, the word that's on the card. They can only use one-word clues, and also there is a timer going. Uh, so you're, you're listening to, I think there's a limit on how many times you can go around the table, too. Uh, listening to these one-word clues, and the dreamer can guess at any point, and they're either right or wrong. And, but they don't know that at the, uh, during the, the round. And there's this 120-second timer going on. And so the, the other people around the table will either put it in the correct pile or the incorrect pile and move on to the next card. And you're trying to get it through as many of these as you possibly can. The twist is that all of the players that are not the dreamer have been given a loyalty card at the beginning of the round. And they're either a, a good spirit or a bad spirit. The good spirits want uh, to get as many cards right along with the dreamer. The bad spirits want to get as many cards wrong, working against the dreamer. And there are also tricksters that want to have things balanced, as balanced as possible. And they get points if the uh, the piles, the good and the incorrect and correct piles are as close to equal as possible. The dreamer is going to earn points based on how many they got right. And they can also earn some bonus points. And this is the interesting twist to this that I I really kind of like. So you still have the mask on. You don't know which ones you've gotten right or which ones you've gotten wrong. And you now, the time is over, and you now need to reenact your dream. You have to recall your dream, string these words together into some sort of story. And if you manage to tag all of the words that you got correct, you get a bonus point. So you have Which to, is really nothing, but it's just fun to do. It is. It, it, it's sort of negligible from, from a points perspective, from a gameplay perspective. It's not that big of a bonus. But we did discover that it could tip the balance between winning and losing. You know, if, if you're, the scores are tied at the end of the game, in the final round of the game, and you, the two tied players are, say, the dreamer and a good spirit, then... The uh, the one point that can determine the game is that bonus point that the dreamer can earn if they manage to get it right. Uh, it, it's very tricky, though. I mean, it's hard enough trying to keep track of the clues you're hearing, come up with a coherent guess, and pay attention to the one or two players who are not giving you clues that match the others, thinking that they're the tricksters. You know, who's the traitor in this situation? And then you have to remember the words that you said and string them together into a narrative. That's really hard. It was a good deal of fun, though. Uh, I I enjoyed playing this with uh, the family game day that this one came out. And it it was a hit. Uh, We we enjoyed doing it. The illustrations, again, are really fun. Um, It is a nice twist on a password-style guessing game, uh, vocabulary game. With the whole loyalty system and that bonus storytelling element at the end, I, I think this is a success. I enjoyed When I Dream. Oh, man, this is really entertaining. Hmm. It's really hard to be the dreamer because you're sitting there and you're listening to the words. You're like, oh, these words all go together. But wait a minute. That word didn't make any sense. Is that person lying to me? Right. And so you're trying to, in your head, figure out who's lying to you. But the problem is that half the people at the table – not half, but some of the people at the table are switching between lying and telling the truth. Mm-hmm. But it's also hard to be the liar. When you see that, you're like, okay, I don't want to be obvious, you know. So if the, the word is water, I'm not going to say hard. Right. Or, well, I guess there is such a thing as hard water. But there you know is. what I mean? You're not, you won't say elephant. Right. So you're going to try to say something that's close to what other people are saying. When I'm when I'm the wrong, I'll sometimes say a very obvious clue and help them get one right. Right. Now let's try to make them get the rest wrong. I right. I need them to trust me. But sometimes you're about to say a word and the person in front of you says that word. Then you're like, oh. Uh, uh. <laughs> right. And, and then you sound like the traitor. Yeah. Right. And, oh, it's, and, and also, I'm not sure why it's so necessary to keep cards hidden during each round. Because... Uh, you could tell. You're like all oh, looking at each other. You're looking at the word. And you look at someone's face. You're like, you just lied. But you can't say that. And there's a lot of silent facial things being done. Right. 
while people are giving the clue. You're pointing at other people. Or when the person guesses and they guess is wrong, some people are silently cheering and others are booing. But you can't say it. You, you can't make that obvious. <laughs> and yep. you can see some people yell at each other really loudly, silently. Yeah. <laughs> during the course of this. It's really fun. And like Eric said, the artwork is amazing. It doesn't mean that much. The biggest problem this game has is there's not enough cards in it. Mm. There's just not enough words. Now, I heard you could take the, the clues out of code names and just use those or you oh, know, yeah. any, any pile of words, right? Sure, yeah. Scategories. Doesn't Scategories have like a random word generator? Really? No, like electronic Scategories. Hmm. I'm not sure, but I'm just not. saying I, I was very, very happy with this game. Um, I think they have a U.S. partner, but I don't know who it is. Um, but I'm pretty sure you'll see this one come over at some point. Yeah, yeah. But this was I, – I, I went into it like, eh, I don't know, and I started playing it, and it was really entertaining. I really enjoyed this one. Cool. So that is uh, – what's it called again? It's uh, When I when Dream. When I Dream. It's really weird. Every year at Essen, there seems to be some theme – and there's a bunch of games about that theme. <laughs> this year, there was two of them. There was Mars and Dreaming. Hmm. So, I don't get it. But yeah. They all get together. There's a secret meeting. So far, this is the best Dreaming game. Yeah, good. Remember the other one we played where you were, like, getting nightmares and... I do. Yeah, that wasn't bad. It... No, it wasn't bad. And then, I think, I wasn't Queen who made it. Someone else made a Dreaming game that Z played. There's at least four Dreaming games that came out at okay. us. It's very odd. So let's get to some normality and talk about a game that came out, well, uh, when, when I was born. Ooh. Every game has a story, and this is one of them. Presenting Biography of a Board Game with your host, Professor Scott Rogers. A few episodes ago, I incorrectly attributed Sid Saxon's Acquire as the winner of the first Spiel des Jahres Award. While Acquire was actually one of the nominated games, the winner of that award was Hare and Tortoise. British game designer and historian David Parlett has authored over 40 books on card, word, and board games, including The Oxford History of Card Games and The Wonderful Oxford History of Board Games, which is a must-have for any board game scholar's library. But Parlett didn't just write about games, he also designed them. In 1969, Parlett created a game based on the then-recent American moon landing called Space Race. In it, he designed a mechanism that allowed players to move around the track without using dice. However, he was unsatisfied with the results and shelved the game. In 1973, Parlett readdressed the mechanism, this time with a new theme inspired by the classic Aesop's fable about the tortoise and the hare. According to Parlett, development of the game was remarkably rapid. On his webpage, he mentions how he invented the game in October, and by December he had licensed it to a publisher. Hare and Tortoise is an unusual racing game where movement is decided by skill rather than chance. The players move their hair pieces forward or backwards around a track by consuming carrots. However, the faster you move, the more carrots you have to consume. Landing on a tortoise square allows the player to gain more carrots, while lettuce squares cause the player to lose a card. Landing on a carrot square allows players to choose whether to gain or lose cards. Why would you want to lose a card? Because players must reach the end of the game with less carrots than your position in the race times 10. The game is very math-heavy, but that's what makes it so different than any other racing game. Hare and Tortoise was published by Inlink Games UK in 1974 with Victorian-inspired art by Shirtsleeve Studios. In 1975, the game was included in Games and Puzzles magazine Top 10 Games of the Year. Intellect was sold in 1976, and the German gaming company Ravensburger published the game under the title Haas und Eigel, a hare and hedgehog, with cover art by Butner and Plummacher. It is this version that won the Spiel des Jahres. In 1980, Haas und Eigel also won the Golden Poppel Award. The game was published by Waddington's in 1980 in a less expensively produced version that accommodated four players rather than the usual six. Waddington's also produced a promotional version of the game in which the carrots were replaced with glasses of Brit Vic brand fruit juice. In 1987, Gibson Games created a version with brand new art by Shirtsleeve Studios. This time, the art was inspired by the late Victorian era. Parlett also worked with Gibson Games to revise the layout of the board, correcting an error that had been on all the previous versions. In 1999, Abacus and Rio Grande published a version where the hare and tortoise are recast as race car drivers, driving vehicles powered by carrots and cabbages. 
Ravensburger published yet another edition in 2008 that used a revised board from the Gibson version, while Gibson published a very stylized version of the game with art by cartoonist Simon Chadwick, in which the Heron Tortoise race past famous London landmarks. Heron Tortoise has sold over 2 million copies and has been published in at least 10 languages. There are even two known pirated editions. An Austrian version of the game which advertises an electrical company and features the mascots Voltager and Wattager. And Scala Relay is the Hungarian version of the game which ditches the carrots and furry animals completely for a purely motor racing theme. Parlet himself revisited his game with 2016's Around the World in 80 Days, published by Yellow. This Jules Verne's inspired version replaced carrots and lettuce with rumors and British pounds as the players race their way around the world. Heron Tortoise has been called the most ingenious race game ever devised, and its unique gameplay, family-friendly theme, and long publishing track record is testament to its esteemed place in board gaming history. Until next time, this has been Biography of a Board Game with your host, Professor Scott Rogers. Hey kids, what's it time for? Bringing up the people! With Dr. Max Davey. Hello. And welcome to Bringing Up the Meeples, where we invite child development and board games over for a cup of tea and a chat. I'm Dr. Max Davy. Now, pay attention. It's not easy, is it? Podcast listeners are usually multitasking. You might be driving right now, or cooking, or pretending to work, or stocking up on tinned goods, or building a nuclear shelter. Anything really. Fortunately, most of us can stop multitasking if we need to focus on one thing. But for some kids, and indeed some adults, that's really tough. And their brains are always firing off in various directions. Some useful, some not so much. There's a lot of attention in research in recent years focused on improving this kind of skills within specifically designed computer games. But, although attention improves within the game... This improvement is not generalised to the rest of the child's life. There may be lots of reasons for this, but one might be that the computer environment is just too different from the physical, real-life environment where the child's difficulties actually occur. It seems plausible that board games may have a similarly positive effect, as they have lots in common with computer games, but also generalise more easily to real-world tasks. Obviously we need to be cautious for the reasons I talked about in episode 483 of the Dice Tower, but I think it's worth exploring. By the way, I'm not convinced, but from my experience, that there's a particular sort of game that helps with the tension problems. I think the question is finding games that these kids can, help, can cope with and enjoy, and then using their motivation to play to practice all the good stuff games provide turn-taking, planning, and impulse control. In my experience, these kids need a quick game, both to explain and play, with loads of theme and engagement, and frequent opportunities for success. Monsters also help, so pretty much my go-to with these guys is King of Tokyo. There are a few other suggestions, and I'll put them up on the guild. Or... If you fancy an amazing experience, you can play a push-your-luck game with children with attention problems. They really, literally, can't stop. The other thing they can't stop is playing video games. Video games are perfectly designed for these kids' brains because they refocus them every, every couple of seconds and reward them almost as frequently. But they don't help, they don't develop skills, certainly in this area, while playing computer games. I see board games more as a kind of part of a balanced lifestyle diet for these kids. Yes, it can include video games, but you also need to throw in other interactions. You need to throw in lots of exercise and, incidentally, lots of sleep. And then you can start to get somewhere. But you need it it takes a lot of effort. This is Max Davey with Bringing Up the Meeples. And now... Another tale of board gaming horror. Oh my, that's horrific. Gather round, children. My girlfriend and I own a board game shop in Amersfoort, the Netherlands. We bought it two years ago and it's running very well. The previous owner didn't have central heating in the shop and with Dutch winters having to rely on small heating units, it's a big waste of energy. So this October, 
just after Essen, we decided to get some better heating. The shop was already fitted with radiators, so we only needed to get a furnace installed. After a few hours, everything was fixed, and we could feel the heat through the radiators. Winter, we were ready. Our shop is heavily dependent on explaining the games to our customers. Therefore, we have all sorts of demo copies open and laid out on some tables in the shop. Older games like Ticket to Ride, for those who want to do something different after Monopoly, but also games like Orleon and Caverna. On this particular day, we had two tables showing some new and some favorite games. Bruges, Welcome to the Dungeon, Seven Wonders Duel as a favorite, and Odin, Great Western Trail, Ticket to Ride, Rails and Sails as new games to take a look at. It was a rainy day outside. The city was empty, but some customers came to our shop. At the moment our furnace was installed, a couple bought some games. I think it was Ticket to Ride Europe. The man who installed our furnace was about to leave when I heard my girlfriend scream, Water! Water, we got a leak! Shut down the heating! Ah!" Something like that. I stepped from the back into the shop and there was a fountain in our shop. Water coming out of a radiator that was hanging next to our counter. The customer did pull out his umbrella and tried to stop the water spreading to the shop. The fountain was the full length of the building, something like eight meters, and even hit our windows. But in its way, it hit our jigsaw puzzle section, plants, and the demo tables. We had to wait until the pressure of the system was down to stop the leak. The radiator was more than ten years old, and the water had never been refreshed. Dark, black water was all over the shop, and it smelled like ten-year-old dirty water. The demo tables did get a full hit. Black water destroyed Great Western Trail, Bruges, Seven Wonders, Welcome to the Dungeon. Some cards of ticket to ride rails and sails. Odin could be saved because of the plastic trays. Shrink wrap saved the rest of the games and puzzles, so it could have been worse. After an hour of cleaning, we did have control over the situation. The damage was minimal in money, but the sight of those games in dirty, stinking black water will never be forgotten. This was not the most stinky tale of our shop, but that didn't affect games just a toilet drain that wasn't working for a lot of years in our cellar. Oh, stop. <laughs> but wait, the story doesn't end here, folks. If you guys remind me, we'll post pictures that they sent of this in the, in the forums. Oh, boy. You saw the pictures, right, Eric? I did not see the pictures. Oh, yes. But they should have, for like gamers, there should be like a sign. If, if the sight of wet cardboard off- offends you... Turn away now. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. That was a good one, or a bad one, I guess. I uh. y- Yes. Eric, this cult of the old thing is really starting to, to wear on me because Brian keeps talking about games that I didn't think were old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Brian's segment's making us feel old. <laughs> oh, Thebes is 10 years old. All right, take it away, Brian. Welcome to Cult of the Old, where I discuss games we may have forgotten about, or games that failed miserably, but still had some good mechanics in it. He's Brian Counter, and everything he does is counterproductive. This week, I wanted to talk about Thebes. It came out in 2007, designed by Peter Prinz, mid rank 7.2 and 316 on Board Game Geek. In brief summary, Thebes is a game where archaeologists go around the Middle East, North Africa, Europe go to specific dig sites, and try to find really cool artifacts for victory points. Throughout the game via cards, players can acquire, by going to certain places, expertise, either general or specific to a site, either by studying it or word-of-mouth kinds of things. Players can also acquire tools like car or blimp rides and other miscellaneous things that will help them with both knowledge and doing things quicker. Players can also acquire victory point cards that go around on a lecture circuit. Key thing here is not to let one player take all of them because they will win. So players spend time going around different places acquiring knowledge and doing other things. 
and eventually will wind up at one of the dig sites. They will decide how much time they want to spend there, and there's a neat little wheel which will tell you how many tokens you can grab out of the bag, depending on how much time you're going to spend there digging. Obviously, you want to be efficient here, but you want to grab as many tokens as you can, because in the bag for each site, there's a lot of blank tokens, which represent nothing, and you've dug up dirt, and those go back in the bag. But then you can find some tokens that have artifacts in them, and those are worth victory points, and the art's pretty cool on those. As the game progresses, you can also do exhibitions where you have a certain number of tokens from certain sites, and if you actually have them, then you get extra victory points for doing those. Obviously, the winner is the one with the most victory points at the end. So that's the basic gist. First, let's start off with a negative. And this is a legit big negative for many people. Randomness. Even me, as the self-proclaimed lover of randomness, this can get a little unwieldy here. What I mean is, my wife Ruthie and I were playing with our friends Randy and Holly, and Holly went to a site with barely any expertise, and by chance pulled out the four most VP-rich tokens at the site. Pulled no sand. I, on the other hand, went to a different site with a lot of expertise, spending a lot of time there. I literally pulled out nothing. Was I mad? Not really. It's a game, of course. But I was annoyed at how this happened. I don't need to win every game. And even then, I wasn't actually angry. But it did annoy me that careful planning did not pay off, and that that can happen in this game. That may be more of an outlier over the course of time and over successive plays, but that can happen, and I fully get why people would be really annoyed by this, and that might deter them from enjoying the game. As a slight counter to that, the game doesn't last all that long if you know what you're doing, but I do get why people would have a problem with this. Once you get past that, the rest is pretty good. The artwork on the cards is pretty good, everything makes sense, it all fits together and gels pretty nicely. And my favorite part of this game is the way it handles time. Listeners should know, probably more so than they want to hear, how much I enjoy the I Split You Choose mechanic out of San Marco. Not in and of itself, but in that game, it works so well, integrates with the game itself, makes sense, adds to the game's fun. In the same way, this concept of time for Thebes works really well. For example, if you're going to acquire some knowledge in a city that's a couple spaces away, that takes a couple weeks to get there, unless you have some kind of help, then it takes more time to acquire the knowledge that you're looking for. And there's a little time wheel on the board. For all the time you spend, you move your token forward. And then whoever is in last place, so to speak, gets the next turn and can take successive turns if they're doing things that take a little bit of time. And this flows throughout the whole game. And I just love it, because even though the concept is simple, it just feels really fluid and integrates really well into the overall picture and theme of this game. Just love that whole time concept and how this game handles it. I think it really adds a lot to the game, and I just love it. So even despite the acknowledged weakness for the randomness thing, the overall picture of this game is a positive one, and I do really enjoy it. Copies are still available, so if this sounds interesting, consider Thebes. Uh, Mr. Vassal, Mr. Vassal, Mr. Vassal, uh, yes, do you have any superpowers? Are you really working on nothing personal, Junior? What are your top ten candy bars? And now Tom, the Dice Tower will authoritatively, Vassal. definitely, Vassal, possibly, Vassal, maybe, Vassal. answer your questions. I, I, uh, Tom, uh, oh, which way to the bathroom? Lachlan writes, Are there any negative criticisms you hear made about games that excite you rather than deter you? For me... When people complain about component quality, I get excited because it often means a lower cost and smaller shelf space. And games having terrible artwork excites me because I have an excuse to print out art replacements. Hmm. That's really weird. <laughs> a well, game having terrible artwork excites you so that because you makes you do more work and you got to print out your own art? Yeah, uh, or, or, you know, it maybe Lachlan seems to be a um, a tinkerer. An improver. It, this, if the game is perfect already, there's nothing I can do to make it better. But <laughs> if there's, I'm, if I'm there's something if there's wrong a... with it, then I can fix it. I can fix this. I like fixing. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's something that's negative because, like, some things that people say that are negative are positives for me. Like they'll go, "Oh man, I don't want all that plastic in my games." Right. Oh, I I do. Um, ah. <laughs> like some of the negatives, like bad rule book. I'm like, oh yeah, oh that, that sounds terrible. I'm trying to think of something where people say it's a negative. Right. Like, I think it's a positive. I mean, sometimes people are like, well, these should have been plastic miniatures, and that I don't necessarily care about that. But that's, I don't know if that's necessarily a positive. It's just not as big of a negative as other people might think. Yeah, the only ones I think that get me excited is when someone complains about something and it's just a difference of opinion. Mm-hmm. 
Like they'll say, oh, this game, there was too much player interaction. I'm like, what? Well, yeah, that That's sounds pretty neat. Or they might say, there wasn't that much player interaction. And I'll go, well, that might not be so bad. Right. <laughs> yeah, it right. depends, you know. Or this cooperative game was too hard. I'm like, well, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I know what people mean, but the, I don't actually, I think his examples confused me more than helped me. <laughs> well, I mean, I can understand the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the complaining, complaining about component quality. Maybe, you know, if he really wants a game with a smaller footprint, I can see it's that. It's different, though. You can still have good component quality and have a smaller footprint. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think there's anything that really applies for me here. John says, how much do you think online commentary on Board Game Geek or other game sites affects the decisions of the publishers? Mm. He says, for example, many were excited to hear the game of Coliseum was going to be reprinted. He personally commented that even though he owns the original, purchasing the reprint is a no-brainer. But then they, the, they posted the cover artwork and, well, I saw the uh, comment thread on that cover artwork and it was not kind to say the least. Hmm. Especially when it showed a shield with claw marks on the back of the shield, which did not necessarily make sense. Hmm. But anyway, do you think Tasty Mental Games took note of this enough to make any changes or do they consider the BGG comments just a vocal minority? How do publishers in general react to this type of online feedback? Interesting. Well, the, the fact is, is that most publishers react differently. So there's no set way. Some publishers, uh, I'm, I'm going to try not to mention any publisher's names, but I know there's at least one publisher who when they see someone, anybody say anything, they're like, should we change that? <laughs> and it's like, no. <laughs> but, and other publishers are like, I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> We're going to do the bitter end. You know, there's, there's all the extremes. Can a thread change something? Definitely. I've definitely seen it happen with artwork. In this case, they did change the cover, I think, the Coliseum, or at least I've seen covers changed. Uh, there was a game several years ago. I want to say it was by Reiner Knizia that came out, and they said, here's the cover of it. It might have been – was it Valley Games who did it? I don't remember who did it. But the cover was hideous. Hmm. And people said, that's awful, blah, blah, blah. And so they changed the cover. And then the artist quit designing board games and went and did something else forever. Oh, my. Well, I'm, maybe that's good. I don't know. I'm not I, – I, <laughs> Yeah. You know, but I remember that distinctly even though I don't remember what the game was. It was a it was some Euro game. But it had a picture of someone's face in the cover and they, they Pablo Picasso did a bit and it just looked bad. Hmm. Kickstarter backers definitely get their vocals in this and there to the point where – you know, Jamie Stegmaier has said he's not doing Kickstarter anymore hmm. because of one of the main reasons is because of the vocal backlash from people who were mad that Scythe wasn't delivered on time and blah, 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 even though it was delivered on time, but any little minor thing. And he just got tired of dealing with that. Wow. So he obviously read it and took it to heart. Uh, I think it's important to note that um, not every publisher is sharing images at the same point in their production process. Like, a, an image comes up of a box cover or here's the board for an upcoming game. It may be beyond the point that any changes can be made at that point. In fact, they may not have wanted to share that image until it was locked down and ready to go. Uh, and so you may complain all you want, but it may be too late to actually make a change in, in that game. Uh, and, and other publishers may uh, share an image and say, what do you think? Me actually looking for feedback uh, but they're probably not going to make too many changes unless there is an overwhelming majority of people saying this doesn't work. What about this issue? And it, it raises a playability issue that they didn't think about before. So if they're looking for feedback, yeah, there, there can be adjustments made. But just because a vocal post or two goes up underneath an image on BoardGameGeek, that isn't necessarily going to change anything in the final product. Yeah, some the bigger publishers do look at Board Game Geek as a vocal minority. Smaller publishers don't because sometimes it isn't for them. Hmm. Chris has a couple of questions. Uh, in a recent episode, a listener asked us about creating a pantheon of great games so that the same titles didn't keep turning up in our top ten lists. For many years, when Games Magazine published their annual Games 100 list of the best games of the year, they included a Hall of Fame section. This separate group consisted of games which had stood the test of time and were considered classics. 
The one requirement was that they must still be in print, so there were a lot of mass market games included. Perhaps the Dice Tower could create its own version of the Hall of Fame. In fact, I remember you doing an episode zero, which was an intro to different types of games. Maybe it's time to update that episode. Well, we actually were going to update our episode zero, but we decided to wait till we have a new show. That's true. Um, well, we actually, the Dice Tower Awards have a Hall of Fame. We just well, haven't inducted yeah, anything into it recently. Well, we've hidden it, too, basically. Um, oh. The thing is with the Hall of Fame, this is one of the, when it comes to board gaming awards, I'm, I'm certainly content with allowing and encouraging a, we have like 130 people who are involved with the Dice Tower Awards this year. Uh-huh. And I'm perfectly fine with that. I don't need to vote on those at all. My opinion doesn't matter. When it comes to Hall of Fame, no, it just, it just irritates me. Because people will vote against a game being in the Hall of Fame because they don't like it. And, and a that Hall just of Fame game should have sli- a, a different um, criteria. Like, I don't like Go, but it should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Maybe Eric and I will do an episode someday where we make a Hall of Fame. Okay. We could do that. Yeah. It's the Vassaler or the Vummerer <laughs> the Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. <laughs> That's a good name, the Vummerer. Mm-hmm. All right. Anyway, we might do it. We'll see. All right, that's the second question. Second question. What's your opinion of making adult versions of popular games? There have always been mass market novelty adult games, but I'm now seeing after dark versions of games like Telestrations, Code Names, and even Cranium. I can only imagine how one would use the clay in that game. While I don't find these adaptations offensive necessarily, do you feel that they cheapen the original product in any way? It feels like they're trying to pander to a lowest common denominator mentality, and the player might lose sight of quality gameplay in favor of snickering like a bunch of middle schoolers. Well, I don't like them. I don't get upset at companies who do them, although I will say that I look at that and say, you're just doing that to make money. Mm. Which, granted, is why, you know, companies, you know, they want to make money. I would not, as a company, I would not pander to that audience. But it is the popular thing to do. I'm not a fan of it. I don't know if it cheapens the original project, but I do sigh. (laughs) Like 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 an old get off my lawn type guy, but I'm trying to get people to get into games and stuff like that turns people away. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm okay. Cards Against Humanity, for example, super popular game, but have you ever heard someone say I'm in gaming today because of Cards Against Humanity? I haven't heard I think Cards Against Humanity grows Cards Against Humanity. I don't think Cards Against Humanity grows the hobby. Maybe. We had a, 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 um, a game night with a couple that my wife met through knitting, and they only had a few games, and one of them was Cards Against Humanity. So that may have drawn them in. Or maybe the knitting. Maybe. Uh, I'm going to go with the knitting. Okay. Sure. That was the beginning of it all. Uh, I think Cards Against Humanity is the impetus for all of this. I mean, it's a huge success. It's a very popular game, and a lot of publishers go, hmm, we could probably capitalize on that. My, I don't really have an issue with the existence of them. You know, if you want to make a variant that's got some silly, dirty words in it, fine. But what, what I worry about is that you go to your local Target, and they've got code names after dark, and not regular code names. And that seems weird to me. Because you can tell somebody, oh yeah, go get code names at Target. And that's not the edition you want if, if you're, you know, telling your grandmother to go buy it. So the, the existence of these After Dark versions and not the original is kind of weird to me. That's, that's my only reservation in the, the, the whole thing. All right. Well, we'll do some more questions in the next episode. Let's get to some more segments. <laughs> It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. Bruno Fiduti, designer of many great games, including Citadels, 
Hi, Eric. Recently posted this on Facebook. A note for game publishers and reviewers. Stop ranking games on a luck strategy scale because it doesn't make sense. Luck is not the opposite of strategy. Backgammon is heavy in both strategy and luck. My masquerade is very light on both. Now let's unpack this idea. What is the relationship between luck, or as I prefer, randomness, and strategy? Now, definition of terms is very important in discussions like these. Strategy is the ability for players to have an overall plan for how to win the game that survives over multiple turns. There are some games where the state of the game changes so rapidly that you can't really plan from turn to turn. When your turn comes up, you just look at the game situation and decide what your best move is right then. These are not strategic at all. They are purely tactical. And of course, this is all on a scale. There's all kinds of shades of gray in between those extremes. And randomness is something happening in the game that is out of control of the players. The roll of a die or the order of cards in a deck are examples. So what is the relationship between strategy and randomness? Do they work counter to each other or are they, as Fiduti claims, unrelated? As with most things, the answer is nuanced and not black and white. Now, a key point is that not all randomness is the same. I like to classify randomness in games into two categories, input randomness and output randomness. Input randomness is random things that happen before you take an action. Then you have to make a decision based on that, but the actions that you take have a definite outcome. For example, in Dominion, the cards that are included in the game's setup are selected randomly. This is input randomness, as once those cards are decided and the piles are placed on the table, you know that if you draw from, say, the blacksmith pile, you will get a blacksmith card. But you don't know in advance that there will be a blacksmith card before the game starts. You have to react to the random draw. In Lagrania, dice are rolled to form a pool that players select from to decide their action. Rolling the dice is random. You don't know if a particular action will be available. But once the pool is formed, if you take a die, you know exactly what action you get. And in backgammon, which Fiduti mentions as being strategic, relies on input randomness. Output randomness, on the other hand, is a mechanic where you take an action and the outcome of that event is random. For example, in Risk, I decide to attack Kamchatka, because I like to say Kamchatka, and then the dice do their magic. You don't know what the outcome of your decision will be in Risk when you make it. The random element comes into play at that point. Now, this division between input and output randomness isn't clean, of course. For example, in Hearts or Bridge, getting your hand of cards is input randomness. Once you have the cards, you can plan a strategy for the hand around that. But in this case, there is other randomness in terms of how the cards are distributed between your opponents, so this slides a little bit away from pure input randomness. And in a way, output randomness from one turn becomes input randomness into the next. But in general, I find this distinction between input and output randomness to be very valuable. I think that this is the fundamental difference between randomness that supports strategy and randomness that undercuts strategy. Input randomness allows the player to build a strategy. Output randomness undercuts it as it limits your ability to plan ahead. For example, let's look at Pandemic. This is a great example of input randomness. Flipping the cards is certainly random and creates a situation that the players need to react to. But that reaction is completely deterministic. If, for example, you had to roll a die to see if you removed a cube from the board rather than simply taking it off as an action, that would make it a much less strategic and satisfying affair, in my opinion. Time Stories, in contrast, is strictly scripted. There really is no input randomness. Events will always happen as the cards dictate when you do multiple runs. In order to add variety, the designers introduced output randomness. There are challenges you have to overcome by rolling dice and trying to get hits. This is probably a necessary design element to add tension and prevent perfect plans, but our group is not a fan of this element, finding it frustrating. Now, a switch from output to input randomness as a design technique really was a hallmark of the Euro game, and from the 90s onwards has firmly established itself as a preferred technique where possible. The main bastion of output randomness right now is in war games, both board and miniature, which is interesting as these are often thought of as highly strategic. And more on that in a future game tech. So to amend Fiduti's original statement, I would say that output randomness, when overused, is the opposite of strategy. Input randomness supports strategic thinking and forces players to react to plans. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. of smart people, insightful board gaming commentary, and Luke Hector.
Hi everyone, Luke from The Broken Meeple, and thanks for joining me on episode 10 of The Starting Tile. And today, I'm discussing abstract games. Abstract games. If you've played something like chess or drafts or anything like that, or even backgammon, then you know what an abstract game is. It's one of those simple games that could be taught in two minutes or five minutes max, and yet would burn your brain out in this head-to-head duel between you and your opponent. They're usually simple to play, and but have a lot of depth and strategy and tactics involved. And here's my two favorite picks to date for abstract games. This first one is not an excuse to get a check in the mail, but it's just a solid abstract game all round and probably my favourite to date, and that is Onitama. This has been reprinted by Arcane Wonders as part of the Dice Tower Essentials line, and this scratches my chess itch, if you will. Basically, you have your five pawns in front of you, four students and a master. It's all set in like Japanese-style martial arts dojo settings, and your opponent has the same thing. The way to win is to either get your pawns to capture the opponent's master pawn or for you to get your master pawn on the opponent's chair. It's basically printed on this grid map in front of you. But how you move on the board is based on these cards and you only have five out of a possible something like 16 plus in a game and they dictate how your pawns can move. But you only have two of them in front of you. What you do is that you choose one of these cards and then you swap it with one in the center. Your opponent does the same, chooses one of his two cards and swaps it with one in the center. So as you can see, the cards you use will eventually get used by your opponent. And therefore you have to think, well, I need to move my pawns in this way, but do I really want to give my opponent this card to potentially hit me backward later? This can be taught in something like two minutes and is easily replayable. It's just so well designed and fits perfectly as a great two-player abstract game for anyone that you want to bring in who has that little bit of an itch for playing chess. My second choice is Camasado, or as you can probably get it now, Camasado Max. Doesn't really matter which version you get. This is a very simple abstract game, but oh my god, will this burn your brain out to cinders by the time you're done with it. You have a grid board with lots of different color squares, and then you have these I believe it's about 8 or 10 really nice looking constructed towers in front of you with Japanese colored lettering on them. And these towers sit at your end of the board. And what happens is that you will pick a tower and you will move it in a straight line, either diagonal forwards or straight forwards. You can't move it back in any way. Now, the crux of this is that you have to get one of your towers onto the opponent's side of the board. Sounds easy, except that where you stop your tower that you've moved dictates the color of the tower your opponent is allowed to move because they're all colored squares all over the place. So if I move my yellow tower onto a green square, the opponent has to move his green tower and then what he lands on dictates my next move. So this is about, this is the poster child of the concept of you lost because you gave your opponent the move to beat you with. And that thought alone will burn your brain out because you are constantly looking at where you're putting this tower in case you just gave your opponent the way to beat you. And yes, you can, you know, construct the pieces and the board state in such a way that you lock your opponent into that state. And that's kind of the uh, whole strategy of the game. But, oh, if you lose this game, most of the time you've got no one to blame but yourself. Very simple. It has an expert mode if you want to take it to the next level. But to bring in a new player, this is about as easy as it gets for an abstract game. Looks the business, but will burn their brains out in a good way. So that's it for me for this episode of The Starting Tile. Thank you for listening and try to remember it's only a game. Take care. It's time for the Dice Towers Question of the Week, sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc., in which our team of gaming experts answers one of your questions, thus increasing the odds that someone will get it right. This week's question... What is your gaming resolution for 2017? Hi everyone, Luke from The Broken Meeple, and as we're talking about resolutions, Happy New Year again. This year I'm going to be curbing my acquisitions of games a little bit. I've already got a pretty extensive collection now, and now I'm at a stage where if I buy one game, another one needs to go. Now obviously I'm getting a lot of review copies in, but you know, the ones that I keep I'm going to be thinking really hard about, and also evaluating which of my old games I'm willing to bring out. But of course, I want to get games played more often as well, and this year I'm going to start 
having more hosted evenings at my place. I've got the table, I've got the games, all I need is the players, but I need to be the one that goes out there and says, hey, you want to come by mine and try out this new board game? And hopefully that will kick off some point very soon. It's Roy Canney from Epic Gaming Night, and for 2017, my gaming resolution is to try to play every game in my collection at least once. I have a ton of great games that I'd love to hit the table again, and this is a great way for me to make sure that they get on the table, and any games that I can't get played in 2017 are going to find their way to the curb. Hey, this is Paul Owen of Dice Tower News. This year, I resolved to play more with friends that I missed out on playing with most of 2016. I have a circle of people I play with all the time, and they're great. We get together on a regular basis. And then I have other friends that I only play with if I make a point of it, like it's an event, like a dinner or a specific weekend get-together. And that's fine, too, but that takes a little more effort to set up. And it's easy to get caught up in life and let the weeks go by and the months. And before you know it, half a year has gone by and you haven't played with these people that you call your friends. This year, I want to change that. I want to make a point of playing on a regular basis with all the people I know who play games. Life is too short not to make those opportunities happen. This is Professor Scott Rogers of Biography of a Board Game. And what is my New Year's resolution regarding games? Well, I live in a small townhouse with a wife and two kids and lots of pets. And there's not a lot of room for games. So I'm just going to be a little more critical uh, and not so fast to jump out and buy a game immediately, but to do a little more research about it or maybe even give it a play test before I actually commit to buy it. Make sure that I really want it and that there's a place for it in my limited shelf space. So that's my New Year's resolution, to just be a little more thoughtful about my game buying. Hello, hello. I'm Ignacio Tuchek, Portal Games. And Stephen Bonnick, or Stronghold Games. We are Board Games Insider. And my New Year's resolution for games would be that I have to go back to writing. I miss my blog. I miss my blog, Board Games That Tell Stories, and I have to go back to writing. This is my resolution. I think it's so hard. Uh, I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to play more games. I'm going to get another regularly scheduled game night out there because, you know, I, I, it's only like once a week now, and it's not good enough. I need more. More gaming for everyone. Hey, everyone. It's Mark Zielinski, and my New Year's resolution... I'm going to only try to buy games that I'm going to play, and I'm going to get rid of the games I'm not going to play. So, for instance, my first order of the year, Fog of War by Jeff Engelstein. Stockpile, I've loved that game since Tom introduced it to me at Dice Tower Con. The Ninja Expansion for Super Dungeon Explorer, and the Angry Neighbors Tile Expansion for Zombicide. I'm happy to report that Fog of War and the Zombicide Tile Expansion have already hit the table. All right. You know, I, I feel like, did we do this last year? I don't remember. Do you want to go back and look, or are you scared? I I don't know. I You know, maybe maybe I will. Uh, I feel like if we did do this, that I probably said the exact same thing. I need to get organized. I feel like you did say this the ga- now. It's coming back to me. Yeah. The uh, the games are, um, are are taking over the house right now, and uh, I need to just carve out some time and and just work on stuff. I've got CONCON uh, Con coming up in March. I need to sell some games. Uh, there's usually a no-ship auction for that. So that, that's got to happen, and I need to get better at making the decisions of what is staying in the house and what isn't and uh, and get rid of some things so that I have at least a chance of getting the games on shelves and not on the floor. Um, and also, I, I would really like to paint my Mice and Mystics figures. Okay, now, uh, I think I you got said supplies. that last year, too. I know. I know. I still want to do it. Hey, how about I finish the, uh, the, the Firefly crate I'm working on? I think I'm actually going to do that. Wait. I just have a few more pieces to put together, and I got to lacquer it. I'll get there. All right. Okay, so for me, I'm going to try to do more live gaming, live streaming games this year um, on the Dice Tower. That's all. I don't know. I'm going to just try to do more of that. Um, I want to get HeroScape to the table a little bit more this year than I have in the past. Hmm. HeroScape is such a marvelous thing, but there's that... Let's set up HeroScape. And you're like, uh, yeah, let's set it up. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a great deal to set it up. But I think I might do that because that would be entertaining. And yep. I, I really need to sort my Dice Masters because I'm like mm. five sets behind now. 
I play with it. Oh, in, so you, you've got them in boxes and you, you don't have them in whatever your storage solution is? Yeah, and there's so much now that it's I, – I actually haven't got rid of any Dice Masters lately because I'm afraid – I don't remember which ones are the duplicates, which means I need to shuffle everything mm. together and sort it out. Uh, by me, I mean I might make the kids do it, but uh... – <laughs> what, what do you store Dice Masters in at this point? Well, I'm storing them in those Dice Masters collection boxes. You, you can buy them. It's the same one that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles box comes in. Or, or the Quarriers uh, uh, but, but I have a new box that I need to get them in from um, – Dayless Productions. Mm. But I feel pretty confident all my dice are not going to fit in that box. Oh. I don't know. I'm just really glad that I'm not collecting Star Wars Destiny. This would be a, a, a terrible <laughs> combination. I am now down to the only collectible game I have where I, I mean, I, where I like keep getting stuff for it is currently is Dice Masters. I, mm. um, unless you want to count Eldritch Horror, that's right, they're putting out expansions for it. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. I, I've avoided Star Wars Destiny as well. I, I, cool stuff's been out of stock on it. And I think if they had it, I would have ordered it a while ago. And maybe it's for the best. It, I think it is. It's a, it's a very good game, but wow, it's an expensive one. Yeah, and I see people have fallen down the rabbit hole, like all these pictures of buying entire boxes of the booster packs and all that. And I'm like, I, you know, I, I don't, I can't, no. I'm still buying Pokemon cards. I don't need another collectible game right now. Yeah, I think I think it's good to have like one or two of them maybe. But other than yeah. that, it, it can become a very dangerous thing. Like Sam's doing Star Wars Imperial Assault, and that's, they're just pumping out figures for it. They just announced three today, and I looked at them and I said, I don't even know who these people are. Oh, good. The Star Wars universe is just that big. They're just <laughs> pump them out. <laughs> Mm-hmm. This was in a comic book one time. You saw the top of this guy's head in episode six. This is a droid in the background. You laugh, but I know a lot of those droids because I used to play Star Wars CCG, and they gave everything yep. a name. Sure. All right, folks. Well, that is that. Tell us in the forums, what is your New Year's resolution? Hey, don't forget. This is probably – this is the second last show where I'll mention the uh, fundraiser, and probably next week I'll be like, you're out of time. <laughs> so don't wait to the last second because that stresses you out, and it really stresses us out. So, uh, yes. But we do appreciate it. We do appreciate everyone who has, has backed us thus far. We're looking forward to this year. We're starting to make plans. I'm that, uh, I don't know, just exciting to look at the year. I've already played two fantastic games that I would already put my top ten for the year. Wow. Uh, well, Santorini was just an amazing game. And the new Rum and Bones Second Tide, which is like a reworking of Rum and Bones slightly. Both mm. just amazing games. But there's a lot of other good games. I've played a lot of really bad games. <laughs> but there's also a lot of great games. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the year. I'm looking forward to see what things change. And, well, we'll see. But until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 492, was recorded on January 19th, 2016. Coming up next week, it's our top 10 games from 15 years ago. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has become more than you can handle, find out how we can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me, with assistance from Jason Thompson, Itai Perez, Eric Matthews, and Rob Seary. Specialized knowledge of adhesives provided by Gloom Maven. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including The Broken Meeple, Start Space, The Game Pit, The Long View, The Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast, and Board Game Blender. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming.
Just to save time, maybe I could use this last、uh, resolution segment for next year's resolution segment. Yeah, you could even keep in the parts where I say, "Hey, didn't you say that last year?" It would save us both time. Maybe we should and see if anyone notices. Oh, that would be hilarious.